Good morning. Unlike many of you in this building or in, in this uh, event, I'm not a specialist builder, manager, engineer or architect, but I have a great team within Seller who, and we're full of highly qualified professionals, surveyors, architects, engineers, investment managers and so on. In fact, I'm the only senior member of the team who is not qualified. But my excuse for that is you can't conduct an orchestra if you're playing an instrument. So they're in the pits and I'm looking over it. Uh, some of you in this audience know that creating a development like the Shard and the wider London Bridge quarter involves a large number of players, all making a range of contributions at different stages of the process, but that need to be tightly controlled. And that's the way I operate the development side of my business. It's been 14 years in the making, actually. And I believe what we've created with the Shard is a work of art, a new contour for London skyline. It hasn't been an easy journey. In fact, it's been realized against all odds. Now, developments of this nature in the UK are never straightforward, and in London, probably many more times more complicated. But you've heard this before. But my commitment and involvement in what has become the Shard and London Bridge Quarter stretches back to 1998. And I hope you know the difference between involvement and commitment. And if you don't, if you take a good breakfast, a hen is involved, but a pig is committed. <laughs> Told you that before. But now it was in November 1998 that I and a couple of guys I brought in as partners acquired a building called Southwark Towers, which sat right next to London Bridge Station. Southwark Towers was a rather typical 1970s office building sitting in a relatively unremarkable area of London. The original intention was to keep it as a dry investment. We had our tenant, PricewaterhouseCoopers, that are in there for 90 years, so it was a very safe investment. But my world, and I believe that of London, changed within months of that purchase. A government white paper was published in 1999, which encouraged high-density buildings, providing they were close to transport hubs. Well, that building couldn't have been closer to London Bridge Station, a key transport hub serving around 50 million passenger trips a year. At a stroke, my perspective of a dry investment changed and I realised there was an opportunity to create something very special. I met with Fred Manson, who headed up Southwark's Planning and Regeneration Department. He, he said he would support redevelopment, providing it was of good architecture. Our original scheme, my original idea, was a 400, for a 400 metre tower. A vertical town, again, it wasn't a bad design, and he suggested we send out a press release, which, which we did. We did that in April 2000, and that initial scheme, as I said, was for a 400 metre skyscraper. It attracted front page coverage and proved to us that London was ready for a tall building. But it became clear to my team we needed a compelling, outstanding design to secure planning permission and funding. I met with architect Renzo Piano in a Berlin restaurant in May 2000. He was exhibiting his Potsdamer Platz redevelopment. I showed him my initial scheme for a very tall tower, and to be blunt, he didn't like it. Tall buildings, he said, weren't his thing. He's changed his mind since, by the way. But <laughs> some of the words he used to describe them were cold, arrogant, impenetrable, dark, and divisive. Now, that wasn't the best start to a meeting. But then he, he began to sketch on the back of the menu and got increasingly more excited. He picked up the energy of the rail lines and the beauty of the river. And as he sketched, I said, you've got it. You've now got my vision. Now, I do enjoy working with architects, but with Renzo, it's just a little bit special. Anyway, I asked him to sign the reverse of the menu, and which he did. He did Renzo to Irvine, he signed it, May 2000, Berlin. And that's when it started. I still have that sketch, which I must say bears a remarkable resemblance to the building you see today. His appointment was critical in creating a first-class design and helping us to obtain planning consent. Uh, we're very different people. 
I'm, he's professional, I'm entrepreneurial, but we shared the same vision, a vision to what was crucially to build a vertical city. The vertical city is a good metaphor. We like the idea that a building would be alive 24 hours a day. For me, it represents a financially secure investment, not depending on any single sector or tenant, and for him, a colourful, inclusive building open to the public through restaurants, hotel and viewing galleries. We also considered the technical aspects of such a building. We wanted to demonstrate that building a tall, concentrated structure is actually more sustainable than low-rise one. While low-rise buildings may seem less arrogant and more modest than its taller cousins, in terms of consumption, the exact opposite is true. Low buildings have greater surface area, create city sprawl, and create huge distances across which services and people need to be moved. Obviously, design was a critical element in our thinking. London was not, still isn't really, known as a high-rise city. Yet we wanted to create a very tall building, London's tallest, in fact. And while it, it was important design made a statement, it was essential the building did not dominate the skyline. Instead, it should taper as it roll, rose and ultimately disappear in the sky. Um, but going back to, uh, right, we're in 2000 now, going back to 2000, we, did, we faced a very demanding application process. We conducted more than 300 public meetings and consultations. The public and local residents loved it. The plans were accepted by Southwark and we achieved a resolution to grant planning consent and that was in April 2002. We always had the backing of the Mayor, Ken Livingstone. Um, he saw it, he got the vision. But inevitably, and unfortunately, it was called in for what was to become one of the most significant public inquiries ever heard in London. Uh, we had nine months to, it cost us 10 million, that inquiry. We had nine months to prepare for it. We worked day and night. And when we got there, we fitted out the inquiry room like a television studio. We, had, we produced around 150 CGI viewing shots showing the building's impact on London skyline from every conceivable angle. At the inquiry lined up against us was English Heritage, who said words to the effect, if you allow this to happen, it would be like a dagger stabbing through the heart of London and other emotive things. Apart from English Heritage, we had St Paul's against us, Cave and historic royal palaces. On our side, we had the Mayor's Office in Southwark. After a long battle, we won that inquiry and obtained consent in 2003. Now we really had increased the value of our project. But even before consent was granted, we acquired another building called New London Bridge House, a 60-style office building which sat less than 50 yards from the Shard. Now, some of the time thought this was a risk, and it maybe it was because we hadn't got planning. But we were lucky and we were prepared. And you know, when preparation meets opportunity, that's when you get lucky. The acquisition of New London Bridge House allowed us to have more control over the important uh, groundscape. It ensured we could create a complementary building to the Shard, which is now known as a news building. These two buildings have the same DNA. They are twins, not identical, one tall and one very tall. Anyway, before construction could start financing necessary and to secure financing pre-lease is pretty critical. Unbeknown to us, the Shangri-La, that incredible hotel group, had been looking for a London hotel site for over 10 years. Our paths crossed by chance in 2000, late in 2004. I showed them our development plans, a vertical town with a hotel in the upper part of the building. I took the chief executive and his team to the top of Southwark Towers, which was level 24. They saw the city to the north, and they saw Westminster and the palace to the west, and then said, we found our Shangri-La. Shangri-La, by the way, loosely means earthly paradise, and for me it was. We signed them up in 2005, it was a 30-year lease, not a management agreement, a 30-year lease. 
By 2006, we received full planning approval for the entire London Bridge Quarter development, including what is now known as the News Building. In 2007, we reached agreement with Credit Suisse to fund the entire London Bridge Quarter project. It was a 1.4 billion facility, credit approved, so they told us. But they began to get nervous and the black clouds of recession loomed and they pulled out. That was not a good day. This was around that time anyway, I was talking to a couple of Qatari guys who represented banks, they were interested in coming in and taking out my original partners, which they did. So I finished up with four partners, uh, Qatar National Bank, a company called Bawa, Q Invest and Qatar Islamic Bank, each of us with a 20% holding. But as some of you are more than aware, the banking crisis worsened, Lehman Brothers collapsed, in fact, it was the worst crisis in living memory, financial crisis. And my four partners were made to sell their stake into the Central Bank of Qatar. Therefore, I just had one partner and still do have. That's a huge honour for us and a privilege. They've shared our, vintage, our vision and have fully funded and supported this development. And thanks to them, we've never been under any pressure to lease at rents less than our business plans and in my view, all the space will be fully leased within the next two or three months. We're now over 90% leased between the two projects. Still have a little bit of space left. You can talk to me about that afterwards if you like. <laughs> in November 2009, 11 years after we first acquired Southwark Towers, construction work began on the Shard. A complex building like the Shard on a very small site of one acre was a challenge. This was further compounded by a veritable spider's web of infrastructure, both above and below ground. The development is located next to one of London's, I told you, one of London's busiest stations, 50 million passenger trips a year, above two tube lines, Northern and Jubilee, above Victorian sewers, and next to narrow streets, and to top it all, right next to Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital, one of the capital's most prestigious and medical establishments. And to further complicate matters, the site is located in one of London's most historic areas. London Bridge area was the site of the first crossing on the Thames that was originally constructed by the Romans. And those of you of a more literate persuasion will also know the area is famous for being both the departure point of Geoffrey Trauch's Canterbury Towers and the home of Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. To construct the Shard, we employed a number of firsts. Top-down construction, which we estimated cut three months from the build program. Um, we also progressed and refined other construction techniques. The slip form core rose slowly and continuously. It was gained at about four, four millimetres every minute, made of concrete, it was poured at a constant speed, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We carried out the UK's largest, I'm told anyway, the largest single concrete pour in April 2010. 5,500 cubic metres were poured continuously over 36 hours involving 700 truck trips, one arriving every three minutes. It is the tallest and most visible building in Western Europe. It has the highest viewing platform in the UK. There are winter, winter gardens on every floor. It is the first vertical town in Europe. And actually, there are only a handful of vertical towns throughout the world. I think it's just one time, Times Warner in New York. I can't think of another one in the States. And we're the only one in Europe. We achieved a plot ratio of one to 32. That's 32 acres of space on a one acre site and we didn't build a fridge design, it tapers. We've used 56,000 square metres of glass, that's equivalent to eight football pitches, 12,700, not very light, 12,700 tonnes of steel were used, the spire alone weighed 500 tonnes and was pre-assembled off-site in a field in Yorkshire, then carried down. We've worked over, my team worked over 9 million man hours, but in that time there were less than a dozen reportable incidents, and most of those were minor. And while a lot of attention is given to the Shard itself, you should know London Bridge Quarter involves a lot more. 
Our vision was and is to create a new district for London in an area which is now or going to be one of the busiest transport hubs in the country and probably in Europe. Thameslink are completing their works and they're investing over two billion. The passenger numbers will increase by uh, 25 million and it will be at least, um, I've been told 10 minutes to go, so I'll keep it fast. Um, that will increase the number of passengers to 75 million trips a year. At the heart of our vision was public access and transport connectivity and the creation of a truly mixed-use development to be enjoyed by everybody. Now, what London Bridge stands for, it comprises of six component parts, all with the same DNA, the same architecture, the same architect. The first component, the Shard, a vertical town of 95 storeys, uh, 1,016 feet, uh, some retail at the lower level, 600,000 square feet of offices, restaurants at levels 31 to 33, then the 202-room Shangri-La Hotel from 34, level 34 to 52, some amazing apartments on 13 floors, just 10 apartments, taking up 62,500 square feet, and then we have the viewing galleries above that. Our vertical transportation system includes 44 lifts and eight escalators. And it is a green building. It has achieved green excellency for sustainable design. The second component, the new, we now call it the news building. That's a 600,000 square foot office building, 430 net. Floor plates, 31,000 at the lower levels and narrowing to 20,000. It is an impressive building. The third component, we build a new station concourse, which completely transformed London Bridge Station. The fourth component, a new 15-route bus station designed by Renzo Piano. And let me tell you, he doesn't design a lot of bus stations. Uh, the fifth component, the public piazza, linking all these developments together. And the sixth, which we now call Shah Place, that is a new 26-storey residential building that will provide 150 apartments and demolition has just started. So, and we expect to complete that by the end of 18. And that will complete the Renzo Trilogy in, at London Bridge. All in all, well, so far we've spent over 62 million on public realm with another 20 million to be spent on the residential place. So that's 82 million. And what have we created? More than 2.3 million of multi-use space in a three billion plus development that is breathing new life in what used to be one of London's most underdeveloped areas. By the end of this year, or shortly into next year, some 12,500 people will be permanently employed in London Bridge Quarter. Um, 4,500 journalists are in the news building. A million visitors a year are enjoying London's most breathtaking views from the viewing galleries. On a clear day, you have a 40-mile radius of view and, and you'll see London as you've never seen it before. The three mid-level restaurants are enjoying unparalleled success they're achieving over 25,000 25, covers a week. The News Corp building was hugely significant. It brought, a, it brought a collection of global media brands to London Bridge Quarter, which include The Times, The Sunday Times, The Sun, Dow Jones, Wall Street Journal, Times Literary Supplement, HarperCollins. And with Al Jazeera in the Shard, the development has become one of the capital's major media hubs. In the Shard offices, we have 23 different office tenants, and the philosophy behind this strategy is that companies would complement each other with their different uses, a philosophy we continue to apply as we near the end of the leasing program. We have an incredible broad range of businesses occupying the Shard, as I said, ensuring we're not dependent on any one sector. The mix ranges from investment banks to lawyers to energy and media companies, as well as a major international healthcare business and global consumer brands. And that's helped to establish London Bridge Quarter as a must go to business area. The new Tower of London was how one journalist put it. And yes, the Shard is indeed a modern marker, a compass in our great city, London, and pointing towards a new hope of prosperity. Londoners feel ownership of the Shard. They can view there, eat there, work there, and sleep there. Uh, 
As I said, it's a new contour for London skyline, and it has been said, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. We have created and are creating a new district for London, and we will continue to expand. Anyway, I said it's against the odds. The industry said we would never get planning consent, and when we did, they said we'd never be able to finance it, and when we did, they said we wouldn't build it. Well, we did. Now, I'm told I'm an unreasonable man at times. Well, let me quote George Bernard Shaw. All hopes of progress lie with the unreasonable man. The reasonable man accepts it can't be done and therefore doesn't try. The unreasonable man tries and often succeeds. Thank you.